Hello, I'm James Dilley, experimental archaeologist and flint napper. For this video, I'm going to be talking about blade cores and the role that they played in prehistoric life. But what actually is a stone blade and what's a core? How do archaeologists put them into some kind of category? When basic terms, it's really a removal or a detachment that is twice as long as its width with roughly parallel sides. Now that can mean you can get flake removals that happen to fall within that criteria but have not come from a blade core. That would be classed an unintentional blade or sometimes a blade flake because it's not truly a blade. For that proper blade it would have to be from a prepared core but the core itself is the central piece of stone that that removal has come from and you can get lots of different types of core. The earliest kinds of core and flake technology come from 3.3 million years ago, the oldest stone tools, but they were just very simple flakes that were detached from a core. Very different to blade cores, but I guess the story has to start somewhere. Flakes from simple cores are not totally random, but there's limited uniformity to them simply because there isn't that forethought to produce flakes. It's really just a case of picking up a stone, striking the edge, ideally in an accurate spot, the flake coming off, and the shape and size of it is very much determined by the power and angle of the strike, and as I said, the shape of that rock. The second removal, that follow-up flake, could be then taken off in the flake scar that you've just created because it'd be a nice flat striking platform. But again, it's still very much determined by the surface topography of that starting piece of stone, which has now become a core, and that strike angle and power. The difference with a blade core is that there's a level of preparation and forethought involved to create removals that have uniformity. Lamina and Lavalois cores are different in that they are prepared cores. There is a plan in mind to create flake removals of a predetermined shape and size with some uniformity. To do this requires a good understanding of the mechanics behind flint napping. It's not something you can do consistently using luck. This demonstrates heightened levels of mental cognition to plan ahead and navigate the various rules and parameters of flaking stone. Intentional blades appear when Neanderthals master Lavalois technology, also known as prepared core technology or tortoise core, which I cover in another video. However, blade core technology that is usually thought about would be classed as lamina, as layers of blades are removed from a core. Though laminar blade production is commonly associated with early modern humans and later Mesolithic groups, researchers argue as early as 300,000 years ago, blades would have been produced. Researchers such as Bar, Josef and Kuhn have looked at evidence from the Levantine Mysterion from sites such as Tabun Cave in Israel. Now this would mean that it would be Neanderthals producing these blades, not modern humans. To produce a blade core, I can use several different methods. I can either use direct percussion with a hard hammer or even a soft hammer. I can use indirect percussion with an antler punch and some kind of hammer, or I can even use pressure to actually drive off the blades. Though I'd need some kind of clamp to do that to hold the core in place. I can also attack the core from more than one direction. If I was to take blades off from one platform at one end, it would be a unipolar core. But if I took blades off from opposing platforms, it would be a bipolar core. With the right application of pressure for blade removal, you can actually produce some seriously large blades. The beauty of pressure flaking is that it can take away some of the potential faults or errors because the punch isn't in quite the right place, but you'll need a, a serious jig and lever to produce off a whacking great blade like this. Different techniques were used by different groups at different times for making blades, and archaeologists can recognise some of those techniques by looking at particular features on either a single stone tool or the core itself. As a flint napper, I use a whole variety of methods and little tricks for getting off good blades. It might be a platform angle at 
might result in a blade of a certain thickness or I might be able to produce a blade that has very little bulb of percussion or has been abraded in a, in a certain way. And all of those features are quite distinctive and certainly for an archaeologist that is a lithic specialist who specialises in looking at stone tools, it's those particular features that help them recognise the work of a certain group from a certain time in a certain place. To make a blade core, I need to choose a piece of stone with some thickness and length to it. The blades can only be as long as the core, so a small core will only give small blades. If the core mass is small, you might not get many blades before it is exhausted. I need to create a platform to start detaching my blades. A large flake or several small flakes should open up an opportunity to start the process. I may need to flake across the platform to change the surface and edge angles. If the striking platform can be flat or even slightly concave, that would be preferable. As I detach blades, it's important to keep an eye on what that platform looks like. Core maintenance allows you to continue detaching good blades. I might need to abrade the edges or even use my punches to change the platform surface. Some of these blades would be useful for scrapers because they have a wider distal end and curve nicely. Others will be better projectile points because they are slightly straighter or can be trimmed to reduce the overall blade curve. Some blades will be useful tools without further retouch, but may be retouched into specific tool types after the fresh edges are blunt. Now that I have a selection of blades, I should really make a few different tools. But a word of warning, blades are fragile and easily break when retouching them. We see this in archaeology, so know it's an issue that has been faced in the past. To make a scraper, which on a blade is typically classed as an end scraper, I need to take a series of flakes from the distal end to create a steep curved edge. A projectile point can come in many forms and certainly did in prehistory. A quite specific example from British prehistory is the Creswellian point, named by Dorothy Garrod after the Ice Age site Creswell Crags on the Nottinghamshire Derbyshire border. These points have an oblique truncation at one end and a retouch down the back. I tend to use a hammer and anvil technique for making these points, which reduces the power required to retouch them. A finished example would have been attached to a wooden shaft of a dart and launched from a spear throw at reindeer or horses around 13 to 12,000 years ago. Another projectile point that utilizes blades in a different way are arrowheads from the late Mesolithic known as transverse or petit tranché arrowheads. They are sometimes also called chisel arrowheads, though in Britain these are typically considered flake-based arrowheads from the Neolithic, which look quite different. Transverse arrowheads made from blades are common in northwest Europe and can be found further afield. Several examples have been found still glued into the arrow shafts at sites such as Tibrin V in Denmark. Experimentation with replicas has shown that these arrowheads have excellent penetration power when loose from replica bows of around 50 pounds in draw weight. This method of making stone tools appears across much of the world because it's a really efficient way of producing cutting edges per kilo of lithic material. The cores are pretty adaptable and they're fairly portable as long as they're not too large and it's a really handy way of being able to produce a nice fresh blade if you're on the move when you get to your next stop. And it's likely that this particular method of making stone tools was a key factor in the development and success of modern humans as they moved and migrated around into different landscapes.